Hello everyone and welcome to uh, one more Golden Talks session and uh, I want to say hello for you and everywhere in the world you are and a very good evening here from Brazil. So uh, today we have an amazing talk with an amazing person that I was for a long time uh, uh, wanting to interview. And uh, this guy, many other people that came here to Golden Talks talk about him. And now we will have this pleasure to have this Golden Talks with him. So before we start, just uh, let me know if you are listening to me well. And uh, if you are seeing me well, I can see here on chat. And if you have questions, you can ask anytime that uh, we will try to answer as soon as possible. Okay. So. Uh, I can see here, oh, André Ontalba. Hello, André, from Luxemburgo. <laughs> How are you, my friend? Uh, Vitor Chiapa. Hello, Cesar Carvalho, Luciana Araújo. How are you, guys? So, uh, let's start our talk. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy. And, uh, 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 oh, my God, I forgot the words. As you know, as you know, this... Uh, uh, interviews in English sometimes put me some pressure. So I'm sorry about some mistakes and uh, let me try again. So here we go. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to announce that uh, today here on the Golden Talk session, we have this amazing guy here. So it's Fritz Hoagland. Hello, Fritz. How are you? Hello. Thank you for having me. I'm, uh, I'm perfectly fine. Uh, good evening. Good. And uh, to everyone listening in. Yeah. And uh, uh, before we start, I want to thank you very much once again, Fritz, because you are in Holland right now. And uh, tell us what time is in your country. Uh, at the moment, it's um, half past midnight here in uh, in Holland. So it's, it's actually quite late. But... It's, it's an okay time to have an interview. It's, it's not really, really, really late in that sense. So it's fine, but it's, it's late. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much to be awake uh, this time. And uh, let's start, start our talking because we want to know more uh, stories about you and your career. So uh, tell us. Uh, how everything started? How did you uh, started to get interested in from computers, from IT, and things like that? Um, well, I'm not exactly sure where it started. Uh, I had a home computer, an MSX, and uh, I think mm -hmm. different countries had different types of home computers in the mm -hmm. 70s, and especially in the 70s, uh, when they were uh, really popular. And uh, I had a friend who started doing some uh, machine coding, so using mm -hmm. the uh, machine code mnemonics on his Z80 uh, CPU. And I found that really interesting. And that was actually the first glimpse into how a computer truly worked. And that fascinated me. Uh, and, and that is actually how I think uh, my, my interest and in my career started. Well, not really my career, but how my interest started in trying to understand how a computer worked. And we talked about this, of course, in our uh, preliminary, uh, preliminary talk. And I'm really fascinated by trying to understand how a computer system truly works. Because if you understand what drives a computer system, then you can understand what is uh, really going on. And that, and that is actually the one thing which, which constantly, I think, goes through my career, is that if you get the, the true understanding of how something works, then it doesn't matter too much on what operating system you work or even what hardware you're using, because you can still understand basically what's going on. Mm -hmm. So circle and uh, uh, you had someone or s some person that uh, uh, gave you any idea about uh, computers IT or you just started to uh, try to get information by yourself? 
Um, well, I am that old that at school we were taught uh, word perfect, mm -hmm. and apparently word perfect uh, as a word processor was really popular in a certain amount of countries, and other countries had different uh, word processors, but definitely in Holland it was word perfect, uh, Lotus 1, 2, 3, mm -hmm. um, and DBase for uh, storing data. That was kind of the standard office setup, and that was what I was taught uh, at middle school. And after middle school, I went to start working. And when I started working, these were the tools. And eventually, I gone off on um, uh, using a DBase three compiler called Clipper, which allowed you to create executables uh, and store data. And that is actually where I started working. So it was already a database at that point in time, although it was not, I'm not even sure it's too long ago whether that was a re relational database, but it was working with data and storing it logically in a table and, uh, and working with the data. And that is what eventually led to uh, me doing Oracle and now in my current day job on uh, uh, working and uh, advocating uh, Yugabyte because that's still all about data and databases. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very cool. So we have a lot to talk about data and Yugabyte. But before we continue, I have a, a, a message here on chat from Marcos Vinicius. Uh -huh. He's saying, hi guys, I'm in a place that the internet is not so good, but I would like to say Thank you, Fritz, for all you did so far to community. If today I know a little bit Ansible, it's because of you, when you were working on Nanky Tech. That's very nice to hear that, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, thank you, Marcus, uh, for saying that. Uh, a lot of what I do is try, uh, a lot of what I publish is, is trying to, to show people how you can do things. And I really mm -hmm. believe in showing how to work with things and uh, uh, for people to pick up and not so much keeping it for myself and show how cool things are because I don't think that is really a sustainable situation. So again, uh, thank you very much. Cool. And uh, one more uh, message here on chat from Luciano. He say, talk of this life. Thank you, Fritz, for sharing your knowledge with us. Yeah, we are just starting, guys. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, what happened next? How was, uh, uh, if you can say a little bit more details when you start in uh, the university, college, and uh, your first job as an IT professional? Um, uh, I didn't really go to university. I uh, started working from, uh, from middle school and I started uh, working on first uh, some programming in Clipper, what, what I was talking about. And then I came across this fascinating thing called Novell, Novell Network. I think, mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether it exists today. It surely isn't widespread uh, as it once was because in, the, in these days uh, it became the golden standard for, for networking at least small networks uh, at companies. And I was amazed that you could do something and connect computers together instead of working on a single computer and having to carry your work using uh, a floppy disk, a diskette, and, uh, and uh, move it to another computer. Because that was uh, when I was at school and doing my first jobs, that was uh, what was the standard. Um, the internet had started at that point in time, and we're now talking early in the 1990s, but it wasn't widespread and the people were starting with the internet through services like CompuServe, but again, it wasn't that widespread. And, um, uh, but it was, uh, it was in that sense, uh, in that sense, it was really fascinating on uh, 
that with Novell you could hook up computers together and uh, use uh, a shared directory, etc. And I found that really fascinating and I decided to stop uh, programming actually and work on creating networks and uh, using this network operating system called Novell. Uh, mm -hmm. And at that point in time, it wasn't TC, uh, it wasn't uh, TCP, so it wasn't TCP/IP, and it wasn't um, um, uh, you didn't have the um, the network topology that you have today. You had to use uh, coax, uh, which mm -hmm. had quite different properties, uh, etc. Mm -hmm. But it was quite fascinating that was actually the, ne the next step in my career in in mm -hmm. seeing that you could hook up computers together and do things with multiple computers well at, at the same time that was that was the next thing but what really fascinated me cool. and so you start as a programmer then you went through the network computers world let's say like that and uh, I cannot imagine how was that time when we didn't have TCP IP. How was to uh, create networks without this? It was easy, it was uh, more complex than it's today. Well, the point is that you didn't have that widespread networks. You didn't have a network which was also connected to, uh, to the internet. It all didn't exist. So these were all small networks and mostly the smaller networks would work reasonably well. Of, of course, there were the issues like you always mm -hmm. have, you know, that's more or less a fact of life that you always yeah. have these few clients where you have these things for which you think, what yeah. is it that I see? I, I'm, I'm not really sure what I see. And I'm not sure if anybody ever saw something like this, but, mm -hmm. uh, but in general, it was reasonably simplistic, although it was for me brand new. And I'm now talking Novel 1, Novel 2, uh, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, and it was uh, uh, later on with Novel 3 that you could additionally, uh, it, didn't, uh, it didn't use TCP IP. And with Novel 3, additionally, you could load uh, what was mm -hmm. called the network, uh, Netware Loadable Module, an NLM and add TCP IP to your network because it used IPX, SPX as a protocol, not TCP IP. Mm -hmm. And um, which meant that you could use this more generalistic TCP IP, which also was used by, uh, by the internet. Although, mm -hmm. like I said, uh, at that point in time, I worked at uh, a garbage combustion center actually. And mm -hmm. I started working uh, alongside Netware. I uh, mm -hmm. started working with um, Oracle. And uh, we had a few Unix systems. And uh, to understand Oracle, every day in the morning, I would fire up the modem, mm -hmm. log in to the internet, and fetch emails from the World Wide Web, and most mm -hmm. predominantly from the uh, Oracle-L mail list, which still exists today, and read about opinions and uh, facts, uh, etc., and started learning about how to do uh, administration. And it was really fascinating to, first of all, having to make the decision to, uh, to try to understand what was an opinion about what was better and what was worse for doing administration which is something which is existing today, right? Uh, there are a lot of things which mm -hmm. the vendor for the Oracle database uh, provides you. There are a lot of people tell you what to do, etc. And it's, it's actually quite hard to understand what is an opinion and what is actually technically a fact better, uh, factually mm -hmm. better. And not only that, in some situations, mm -hmm. some things are a good solution. And in another situation, the same solution could not really apply. And um, it was fascinating to learn at that time. And I hadn't seen a lot because I just worked at this one place where I found 
this, uh, I think it was Unix on Intel already, but really, really early. And it had an Oracle database version 7016. I mm. remember the version because that was the very first version I started working with Oracle. And it was all mm -hmm. really simple in the looking in hindsight, let, let me put mm -hmm. it that way. It was all mm -hmm. very simple and there wasn't so much that you could do, but, but still, because mm -hmm. we didn't know what you could do with it all, it was all still really <laughs> fascinating and we had to learn, uh, and I had to learn a lot. Mm -hmm. But until that period, that, that point in time, you didn't have to work yet with databases, only programming and networks, right? Well, at that point in time, I uh, uh, worked with uh, networks and I did uh, network administration. And at, mm -hmm. uh, when I started working, I did uh, at this uh, garbage combustion center, uh, which had a brand new office, had a brand new network. I started doing network administration and there they had a few Unix systems, which I hadn't seen uh, before that time. And this is the early 1990s. Um, I started seeing these Unix systems and uh, they run Oracle. And that was where I ran into them and got really fascinated by it. And mm -hmm. it resembled and it um, uh, had the old thing which I was taught about managing data, only it was all so different because it used Unix and uh, it, uh, it used an Oracle database, which I hadn't seen uh, before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's cool. And uh, when you started in working with these databases, what you thought? You already had experience with programming networks and uh, you started to see databases. It was like fell in love for the first time you saw or what happened to you dedicated your career next on databases? Um, well, at that point in time, I figured out that um if I wanted to move ahead, I was really young. I understood that I needed to, uh, eventually I needed to move on and I needed to specialize because if, if you want to be great at something, you first need to pick your topic. You cannot be great at everything that you touch. Maybe there are some humans who can do that, but almost anybody that I know is, is, is really good at a specific area and for one person this area is bigger than the other but it's always a specific area and uh, uh, some people in other areas are really not that good or are common uh, j just like me that uh, you know when I when I need to drive up to some uh, some place and I need to go somewhere I always so, feel so foolish because if I haven't been anywhere I always have the feeling I drive three times past it before I understand how it all works and how you could really drive to it. You know, the, there is, there is a limit to what you can be truly good at. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. That's cool. And, uh, uh, you, when we talked before, you said me one thing that I, I found very cool about these things that you are saying. And it's regarding basic principles. Can you tell us a little bit of what it is and what do you think about the basic principles about uh, tech things? Uh, yes, yes, we, um, indeed. We had this talk before. And like I already said earlier, I am truly convinced that if you want to be uh, a specialist and if you want to understand things, you have to strip it down to its uh, bare essence and understand what is going on in the computer system. And in fact, uh, and I, I've said this to many people uh, to which I've talked, uh, and also to younger people when, I, I, uh, when I, I speak to people and I try to encourage them on, uh, on, uh, on with their career, is if you look at things, and you start digging down into how things really work. And I mean, really, really deep. And you might think, do I need that? But once you get a good fundamental understanding of how things work, then you see that things 
at a at a basic level, at at a really deep level, pretty much work the same like they did when mm -hmm. computer systems started, and it all uh, a lot of things have additional layers stacked on top of it, but the essence of it is is still going on. So in in that sense, if you look at the uh, IT world today, there are new things popping. Sorry, there are new things popping up all over the place. But if you take a step back and you think about the internet, uh, which is, as far as I can see, still predominantly IP version four. Uh, mm -hmm. IP version four hasn't changed any. Uh, the essence of that hasn't changed anything since I started looking into it into the 90, in the 1990s. And it probably mm -hmm. hasn't changed much, of mm -hmm. course, except for all the layers and all the additional protocols which have been made. But the essence hasn't changed much since probably in the 1960s when it was uh, conceived and it was started with uh, ARPANET. I wasn't mm -hmm. there at that, play, uh, at that point in time, obviously. But mm -hmm. ever since I started learning um, TCPIP in the 1990s, uh, that same knowledge keeps me going on uh, today. When, when I try to troubleshoot or dig down into issues with networking, and, and that comes down to uh, what you said earlier. Mm -hmm. If you just learn how things work on the surface, then um, I think you're more an operator than, than a database specialist. And that is not meant uh, negatively, but uh, hopefully some people are, are listening and uh, are desiring to do something like what I've did and what I've published. And uh, I think that there are quite some people who are capable of doing that just like mm -hmm. I am have been doing that and am doing that. The only thing is, are you willing to invest that time to dig down into all these details? Mm -hmm. And uh, what I quite much see is that people are, uh, are willing to do that for some time mm -hmm. uh, and uh, at a certain point in time stop. And the problem is that uh, unless you've spent all that time and that time for me it was 15 years on generating a, a fundament on learning how operating systems work learning how hardware works cpus work disks work network works etc mm -hmm. once you've once you've got that uh, once you've got that fundament then anything new which comes up is reasonably easy to learn because you can just stack it upon that fundament which you've already learned. Hopefully no. that makes sense to you because I, I genuinely believe that is true and it is doable by much more persons than we see uh, as being around the specialists but you have to be willing to invest that time to dig down into all these different areas. Hmm. Uh, I was just listening here, my dog is doing a lot of noise, sorry about that, but keeping focus here <laughs> on the live. Uh, when you uh, talking about this basic principle and how did you uh, found that, that uh, learn how things work, these things uh, help and make you go deep on Oracle technologies and also in open source technology? Um, I worked for this uh, garbage combustion center and I eventually um, understood that I built up this knowledge and at that point in time I was just, you know, doing what I like. I, I had quite some time on my hands. The, um, I managed a network of approximately 100 people. I think I managed it reasonably well and I had time on my hands and I could learn. I was allowed to take courses with Oracle and that was, uh, it was a different time. So that, that was actually reasonably special. So I did some work. So I got this head start 
of uh, taking courses with, I'm not sure if it was called Oracle University at that time, but I got this knowledge, so I got this head start. You, you know, you cannot start if you have nothing to build upon. And I was at that point in time where I needed first this fundament uh, to build upon. So I gone to Oracle University, I learned stuff. And once you get this knowledge from, uh, from Oracle University, you have these things which you can try. And this was a different time because nowadays, I believe you can find so much on the internet. You know, you just Google a few keywords and you find information and be aware that information can be anything from right to wrong and anything in between so uh, but also uh, what you learn at the school uh, and i think it's it's sensible to always be have a healthy uh, uh, judgment of what you learn whether it makes sense because not everything, even not what, what is in books, always makes sense or is truly the best thing to do. But you have to decide that for yourself. So I got in this knowledge and I started learning on trying to understand how it worked. And um, at a certain point in time, I think I've gotten a certain amount of knowledge. And then uh, I understood that I needed to uh, move on and uh, I got hired by an ex uh, by a consulting company at that time uh, called uh, CMG in Holland and I started uh, getting getting hired as an Oracle person and setting up databases and implementing databases and that was really the next thing because before that I've never, never truly done that. So I uh, started doing that. And uh, I learned a lot at that uh, point in time and uh, could further build upon this uh, fundament, which I have already started building uh, before that at this uh, previous em employer. All right, all right. And uh... Uh, with all of this knowledge and with all of this experience that you had in this time, when you started thinking about uh, blog and sharing knowledge with others, uh, or anything happened to you thinking, hey, let me share a little bit with people, how was this for you? Um... At this point in time, I uh, worked for this employer where I was now landed after uh, this, uh, this first employer. And um, uh, I was tuning a database for petrol stations, for um, all the Shell petrol stations in Holland, which were 250 mm -hmm. petrol stations at that time. And mm -hmm. This guy, this colleague uh, from CMG in Holland, uh, did a review of the work we did uh, called Peter mm -hmm. Visser. And he's also a, a blogger and somebody who's uh, presenting everywhere. And he came up to me and uh, I explained to him what I've done. And he said to me, you should say something about it. Can you say something about how you've done this because you should present this and he was actually the person who got me to uh, 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 who introduced me to this whole phenomenon of uh, sharing knowledge and uh, presenting and, and conferences so he was he was the person who advised me to start doing this because i built up this knowledge and uh, a lot of other people, uh, in his opinion, could learn from that. So that, that was actually what started it all for me. That's very cool. Yeah. And by the way, we uh, already had done an interview with Pete DeVirce and it was very nice. So if Pete, you are seeing us anytime, just say cheers to you. <laughs> it's very nice. He's a, a traveler DBA. <laughs> yeah. 
Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, s since the day I uh, I know him, he's been he's been doing that. I'm way lesser a traveler and uh, I like to just uh, study things and uh, be more at home in that sense but since the day I met him he is uh, he was really trying to combine traveling uh, and going places together with doing uh, Oracle DBA work so yes absolutely okay. <laughs> yes cool and uh, we have here uh, in chat and Fritz, uh, Leonardo Sicconi say first, good evening, good evening for you too, Leonardo. And he say, I want to say that Fritz blog posts have saved me at least 10 times during my career. Thank you so much, Fritz Hogan. Oh, that's very cool. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, he say, Fritz, if possible, share with us the reasons that lead you to choose Yugabyte and why you think Cloud databases are the future. I think you think that. We're going to talk this plan to talk later, but uh, if you can talk now, it's a good moment, true. Yeah. Um, this is um, because uh, I try to build, uh, I try to build knowledge. Uh, mm -hmm. At a certain point in time, you also need to step back at this focus point on Oracle and think about, you know, how do things look like in the future? And uh, the number one reason for choosing a Yugabyte is actually when I explain what, uh, what Yugabyte does. And for me, the main thing for, uh, for Yugabyte, and, and that is truly, that is not so much commercial, but that is truly from a technical point of view is Yugabyte uh, if you use it with a replication factor of three, spreads data inside the database core in three places. So the same data is in three places, which means you can place it in three availability zones and therefore have your data spread out in multiple places, which means that if one of these places moves away or, uh, you know, if one availability zone um, uh, uh, goes down the database is still alive that is how Yugabyte works and uh, when I explain this to people who have no knowledge of databases explaining them that uh, this database which I started working with which I think is very special because it allows you to still carry on working when uh, one of three availability zones in the cloud stops then people say to me, but wait a minute, isn't this how databases uh, already work or are supposed to be working? And I think that that takes the essence of, of, of why I chosen it because, and this was also in my uh, DOAC, so the German database uh, Oracle user group, uh, which I tried saying. Uh, Oracle and, and not only Oracle, but also, uh, well, all the other traditional databases, vendors and open source databases have created a lot of uh, layers on top of the database trying to ease uh, uh, high availability and disaster recovery for you. But any DBA who's in the field who worked and who has had crash databases will tell you and can tell you that it still today is not that simple. The, the possibilities today are there to make it a completely seamless exercise. But in reality, just go to a client who has a crash database as a DBA and you'll see what I, what I am talking about. If you have a traditional database and it crashes, you are in a difficult situation and even and if you have a standby database, <laughs> yeah. then that is a hard place to be at and you need to arrange a lot of things and uh, you'll, you will find that because people don't, most people 
don't rehearse doing a failover. And therefore, you will find that people forgotten to change things, did not really carefully administer things, uh, and therefore a failover will not go that smooth. And that, in essence, is, is the reason. So, yes, I think that uh, a distributed database, so I'm not saying Yugabyte per se, of course I believe in the Yugabyte product, that, that is why I work at Yugabyte, but I think that the principle of a distributed database is the future. Yeah, uh, and it's a very good uh, answer, and uh, Leonardo has uh, put it here on chat, say answer, 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 answer. Uh, database reliability have changed a lot during the past 10, 15 years. Leverage cloud definitely changed the game, yeah. And the distributed database, this is a thing that uh, we had some other talks, but uh, you uh, put a specific talk that makes a lot of sense. And uh, things really changed and database rely reliability, it's a very key point to cloud and to uh, database that are working not in only one or two machines, but working independently in many other machines, right? Yeah. Absolutely. If I look at when I started in IT in the 1990s and uh, moving on into the 2000s um, and, and today's day, if you look at the improvement that the reliability and that I think was aiming at that, if you look at the re reliability of, of hardware and operating systems, and uh, things like rate sets, etc., that it's immense. Truly, a normal computer system really doesn't die in your hands. Uh, I remember from the 1990s, from the, uh, from the truly early days, where hard drives truly just became available, that hard drives mm -hmm. were that tedious, that, that sensible, uh, sorry, no, sensitive, Hard drives were that sensitive that if we had a computer system and it ran for a year and we did um, um, and we did administer them, so we just we had a, the yearly uh, the the yearly maintenance where we would turn off the system and would just take all the dust out of the computer system in these times. That it was not uncommon that of the one or two hard drives that one would fail simply because it had run for so long and a hard drive you know at that time was uh, a mechanical device so it would slightly wear out and just by stopping it it could just would not be able to uh, to start up again and in today's world uh, hard drives are the hard drives which still are there, which are mechanical, are reliable. And mm -hmm. SSDs have become reliable and we've got these RAID sets on top of them, which allows you to just switch a disk inside the set whilst it is still running, which is also really, if you think about the early days and then going to that stage, that whilst the system is running, you can swap disks that is, all, that is already actually mind-blowing. Just think about it, that you can do that. You know, like changing a tire on a car while you're still driving. It's, it's that mind-blowing <laughs> for me, actually. <laughs> yeah, of course it is. And uh, one thing that came to my mind is like, uh, in the past, computers work like uh, uh, different uh, things. Uh, I mean, if you have a rack, you have many different computers work as one. With a distributed database, you have many computers working alone, but together at the same time, right? Yeah. Rack always has been a bit special uh, in, in a lot of ways, in, in truly a lot of ways. And Rack, I think, aids to high, high availability in the sense that you have multiple computer systems. I haven't seen any rack database which truly could sustain the load uh, which was put onto it 
where one of the nodes would be taken off, you know, which is the classical case of uh, high availability for REC, because REC is, has been, always has been expensive, is a marvelous piece of technology, don't forget that. Uh, in the earlier days, in, uh, before REC, when it was call, called Oracle Parallel Server, I haven't dealt with it a lot, but that was hard to deal with because you essentially had to set everything by hand and a lot of things would have to go by disk. You could not change, uh, how do you say it? Um, for certain things, you, you had to do a disk I.O., which in REC today can just seamlessly move over to another node. REC made a lot of things really easy, which were hard to do with Parallel Server. But the essence is, even in, in these days with Parallel Server, I haven't seen a single system which uh, had multiple nodes to deal with the huge load, so it was spread out over multiple machines, which could truly sustain this load when one of the nodes was taken off. In other words, mm -hmm. you could argue whether it was truly a high available solution or whether it was just a way to get a load running in the first place and in that sense more a performance option rather than a high availability option. Mm -hmm. That's not sure if this message comes across, but I always had a problem with it being a high availability solution. It has an, a high availability component in it, absolutely. But don't forget that there is still, the database is still a single image sitting on disk. Okay. We all know, everybody who has dealt with uh, real application clusters knows that you have to have shared disks uh, and that in essence, uh, that the data, not in essence, the data is still sitting at a single place. And that is the big difference with a distributed database where the data is physically spread out in different places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is a, a big difference of these two different technologies, right? And as you're talking about uh, Oracle technologies, uh, can you say a little bit how was for you the experience to uh, you, you write a blog, then uh, you become an Oracle Ace, an Oracle Ace director, then you start to uh, uh, participate in some conference, and of course, knowing, be knowing uh, for many people around the world. How was all of this experience for you? Uh, well, let me go back a bit, like uh, like Pete and Pete. Uh, showed me that there were these this conferences and that mm -hmm. I knew stuff which I should present about. Uh, and, and, and the essence is, and anyone who is interested in doing that is, is, is to truly, you know, I want to inspire you to take a topic which you find interesting and try to just understand that whole topic, uh, that whole topic from uh, top to bottom truly try to understand it and, and see if you can spot things here and there which are wrong or maybe even things which the vendor is, you think, doing it wrong. And, and some of it is, um, is an opinion and some of it might, might be a fact. But if you can argue and if you can reason why you think it might be right or wrong to do things, that, that would be good. And then try to find peers who have an interest in the same topic and see if you can talk about that with them. That, that would be for, for listeners who are aspiring uh, to, to do something like that. Uh, for me, uh, Pete advised me to, uh, uh, to start pr uh, presenting about it. And it was first, you know, there were a few conferences, uh, Oracle conferences in Holland. And uh, I uh, started submitting for these and well, now I should say that at first I prepared something like a presentation and I started talking to my colleagues and ex started explaining to them, you know, you find something which you see, uh, you find an issue that you see and you see it happening a few times 
and you find out that you are the sole person dealing with that issue, so you try to build uh, a logical story and, and try to explain to people what it is that you're doing and how they could do this, uh, this thing and then uh, work on that. And uh, uh, what I did uh, was uh, submit for a conference uh, after talking internally in, in CMG at that time, uh, I started submitting for conferences outside of my company. So if you want to be an ace, but you haven't really uh, started on, on, on doing this, start to build up this knowledge, talk with peers, and then try to present what you have to uh, some co-workers and see if they can make sense of what you're saying, see if it's logical, if, it's, if the ordering makes sense, etc. And then build it up. Then if you work at a bigger company, and I happen, I happen to work at a bigger company, see if they have some kind of gathering or a uh, special interest group on the technology you're working and see if you can, can present there. They're quite often eager to get people in and uh, and then present and, and slowly build it up. I am convinced that no single Oracle Ace or Ace Director or whatever uh, people you consider rockstar, no one ever started by putting a presentation together and go on stage on Oracle Open World and present to, uh, to hundreds of people. Nobody ever did that. It always starts off with, you know, build up your knowledge, uh, go to others, look at others how, and see how they do it and see what you like in how others present. Because it doesn't make sense to one-on-one -on -one copy another. Uh, to copy uh, how somebody else is doing it because then you're a copy of someone else. Pick the parts that you like from anyone, try to make that your own and try to be uh, try to be the best in all these different things which you've picked up from others and see if that works for you and see if that works for your public. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, if you're presenting, your whole reason for presenting is to get something across to somebody else. So if you're the only one who thinks you're good, then you're probably doing it wrong. It has to be the people who think you're, or you're doing it right. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and again, maybe this is not super encouraging. Well, I hope it is encouraging. What I'm trying to say is nobody just became this uh, rock star of, of technology from one day to the other. You have to build it up. You have to build up your knowledge, uh, start presenting and say what others say and pick that up mm -hmm. and change things around. And some things are simply not doable, you know. Uh, I admire, truly admire the work of Connor McDonald. And if not sure how many people saw Connor present, but yeah. I've seen him I present so and I, yeah. I was amazed at how he did it. And it was almost like, how can you say it? Uh, I, I think it's not the style that I aspire to be, but when I saw him present, I was amazed. And it is an absolute, really, really good to see him present. Uh, and uh, I very much like to see it. It's, it's not something that I did and I can do, uh, but I very much like it. And, and that is also another thing. There are also things which just would take too much, in this case, would take too much of me to rehearse the talk on itself, uh, for which I simply do not have the time. So I chosen not to go down that, that route, despite the fact that I really like how he's presenting and the way he's doing it, and really, really hats off to him in on how he does it. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I had the opportunity to see here in Brazil the, in the last GOB Tech Day that you had. And yeah, it was an amazing presentation. Cool. And uh, still talk about this conference. Is there any 
um, a specific thing that happened, a funny thing or interesting thing that you'd like to share with us or traveling, anything that you want to share with us? Um, I'm not really sure what, what, what the question is here. Um, I, okay. I, I, I think I today's can. world is, is pretty much closed down and in Holland tomorrow probably there will be uh, there will be announced that there will be more uh, cutoffs to uh, to uh, uh, possibilities of doing things so we we will be more constrained in doing things to fight COVID sorry but um, once the world opens up I, I hope to travel again uh, myself uh, mm -hmm. a bit uh, but your right. question was yeah uh, i was uh wondering if you had any funny thing that happened in the conference that you participate any uh curious thing that you want to share with us you you went to many conferences right when yeah you, yeah and in this period uh there are anything funny or interesting or uh, a moment that was remarkable that you wanted to share with us? Uh, well, in general, conferences are quite alike uh, f from a helicopter view, from, from a really high up view, a lot of the conferences. Uh, and that is not negative to the conferences, but uh, are quite quite alike. Uh, um, mm -hmm. um, I've I've had some uh, amazing things which I encountered on doing uh, investigation into database issues, uh, like uh, uh, learning on the news in in Holland uh, at this time mm -hmm. that uh, the government uh, was talking about. Uh, a, fail, uh, a failing issue with a project which was uh, inf uh, affecting uh, mm -hmm. the entirety of Holland, all the driving schools in Holland. And then I was asked to go to fix a database problem. And it turned out mm -hmm. to be this actual problem where the government was talking about in the news. This was something which I found quite remarkable. and. Uh, uh, quite close to uh, <laughs> become uh, to be getting on the news. Although as a database specialist, if you're in the news, it's probably negative. It's probably not a positive thing. But the amazing story here was that uh, when I was investigating this uh, this database problem, I was told to fix a database problem, and uh, um, I've actually spent a few hours looking into a database which had no problem at all. That was that was actually the most remarkable thing happening there. And what turned out to be the case here was that the development team, because it turned out that they developed a new system for scheduling a driving tests and uh, this system didn't work and the people who made this software decided that it was a database problem and when i came in i was told to fix the problem and when i looked at the database there was no problem to see actually in the database mm -hmm. and uh, this moved on to them um, proving that the database wasn't a problem and then we got a really awkward situation that the, the application people then were quite embarrassed that they, when they found out that what they said was the problem, mind you, mm -hmm. which was affecting every single driving school in Holland, was not really the problem they anticipated. And it turned out to be actually a networking problem at the end, but that was that was quite uh, quite an interesting story in uh, in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
absolutely yeah and uh, one more talk that i want to talk you, with you is uh, you worked for a uh, consider considerable time on name tech right how was for you this yep. experience and i usually say that any tech made uh, the avengers team right because the best of the best was working together in that company right yeah well probably and i hope all the people who worked at anki tech will uh, are saying the same thing personally for me i was working for a dutch company at that time and uh, Kerry osborne uh, the founder of anki tech uh, invited me to a conference in dallas about um, about engineered systems about um, exadata and at this conference i asked him if he could hire me because i wasn't uh, i was ready to move on from the company i worked for in in holland and he said well i can make that happen and then a few months later i uh, i worked with kerry and it was it it was actually that easy but mind you i uh, spent a lot of time on understanding how exadata worked and at that point in time uh, it wasn't too long before i uh, i think one or two years earlier i uh, worked on uh, trying to understand how direct path read worked in oracle which to that day nobody figured out and nobody knew probably aside from some people in oracle and uh, uh, this is another part of, of uh, going back to doing investigations i wanted to know how that worked but there was almost there was no documentation there was no literature there were no most documents uh, not even bug reports which truly shed a light on how this worked so i spent one and a half year uh, mind that mine and one and a half year on investigating how direct path reads worked and uh, after a year i could align all the different uh, tools to eventually dig down into how it worked and figure out how it worked and then present about it but it took me a year mm -hmm. on almost daily studying and hypothesizing mm -hmm. about things and once i got the hypothesis uh, trying to figure out how to prove it to myself and then proving that i'm wrong and then moving on just until uh, and um, this is important because exadata fundamentally is uh, when it started off was uh, was fundamentally a data warehouse appliance and the smart scans which were the original secret source of exadata were fundamentally based upon uh, direct path reads and how they worked so that was where these things aligned and mm -hmm. uh, which was probably a reason why uh, uh, why uh, Kerry hired me and uh, once I got into the team I you know we were in this team with all these people who part had participated in books who uh, presented worldwide uh, and uh, we were just all working together and that was yeah that that was an environment which was in in that sense really special because you know we everybody had its own um, area of of understanding and its own specialisms so if there was anything you would think about or would want to know then uh, you could just go to these people or ask on our internal mail list and people would tell you about how stuff worked uh, and uh, this was was really amazing also in this time i uh, worked with um, carlos sierra and mauro pagano uh, and we uh, part, uh, we worked on uh, building this capacity management tool 
uh, where, which was called ESP, for which uh, and I did. Uh, it was Carlos and Mauro who predominantly worked on that at that point in time, and I just participated on. You know, first understanding it, and then um, uh, finding stuff which didn't really work, and and making it better, etc., and 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 moving on from that uh, from there. But yeah, uh, that was that was a really uh, special uh, that was a really special time on this, you know, this <laughs> company which uh, existed for a certain part of all. Of, of a lot of people uh, writing blogs, uh, writing books, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and having their specialisms, and a lot of people having all their uh, uh, knowing their people inside Oracle, and that was also one of the things which Gary brought to uh, to me uh, too, where if you would run into a problem and nobody knew what it was, that he knew somebody in Oracle. Uh, in Oracle development or in Oracle, which you could get into contact with and then work on that uh, together with people from Oracle. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it looks like a very good period, all of these great and amazing guys working together, isn't it? And uh, yeah. yeah, we have here a uh, question on the chat saying, Fritz, what is your strategy to learn new things and dive into different subjects? Um, yeah, I, I tried, uh, I partly tried explaining about that before. And I think the most important thing is that you have to, to like it. If you're doing it just for the idea that it will bring you uh, that it will make you famous or bring you a lot of money, then probably after a few years, you will just quit because it's boring if you have to do it and you do not really like to do that. Which, mm -hmm. which means, and what I'm trying to say is, if, if you, you have to have this desire and you have to like the fact that you're working with kind of abstract technical things, and uh, digging down into it and um, see if you can find people who are looking at it in the same way, who can help you so you can get a head start because they've done some of the work and, uh, uh, and uh, work together with them and, uh, and do your part. But like I said, the, the thing which, which I, uh, vividly remember from starting uh, at CMG, where there were a lot of people who came from college who were saying that, you know, they wanted to be either this technical rock star or they actually wanted to be a manager, but they had to do technical stuff for a few years just to become this manager. Both things are not really sustainable, in my opinion, because if you have to do stuff which you don't really like, then I can guarantee you that sooner or later you are to hate it because you do not really like it. And uh, um, if you want a rock star overnight, I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. In my mind, and not only with computers, so, you know, uh, genuine rock stars in the rock. I think if you dig down into their life, I will see that they probably spent the greater part of their career building it up, rehearsing, mm -hmm. uh, build up um, a network of people. I might not have said that too much, but build up your network, talk to people uh, so that if you cannot know everything, nobody knows everything. That's all myth. You have to rely on people and you have to it's even the way we think. If, if, if I now go back to this uh, time where I did Novel Networks, I had this, I had this map. It was kind of a map. Uh, no, a map is the wrong word. Uh, I had this um, uh, cover which could, mm -hmm. could hold disks. Mm -hmm. And 
at that point in time because the, there wasn't the internet and everything there was was what was available in your area so i had this uh, uh, i had th uh, uh, I think it was something like 12 or 18, uh, three and a half inch skets with drivers and tools. And I had a feeling that that was everything that I needed to solve mm -hmm. any problem that I could, could, could handle. And mm -hmm. the reason for saying it is that today the world is completely different and there is so much diversity in anything that you cannot know all that so you have to rely on people and the the bigger your network is and 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 even you know when i started going to conferences and i saw tanel powder probably uh, and hopefully everybody knows uh, tanel uh, when i first saw him present i think it was in denmark or something like that i I was sitting there trying to memorize everything, every, every slide and understand everything that he said. If I now look at myself today doing my stuff, I don't try to memorize that many things today. And actually what I, what I do today, and, and this might be good to realize for a lot of people, you cannot memorize all this stuff. Maybe if you're really young and starting off, when you have, um, uh, when you have learned not so much yet, you can soak up all this, this uh, a certain part of knowledge. But at a certain po point in time, you have to just change your brain in a way to say, okay, this point of knowledge, I can find it here and there. You know, I mm -hmm. put it in a file and I save it. And I just need to remember that whenever it's about topic X, Y, Z, I need to look there. I cannot and do not memorize anything anymore like I did uh, uh, at the end of the 1990s and the early 2000s. Things have just been, things are just too widespread and too diverse to, to memorize them all. Okay. that's true that's true and this is a very good thing to you share and to keep in mind yeah do a very good network uh, rely on people and don't try to do everything by yourself because it's almost yeah. impossible as a human being right <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes yes it's it's pretty much like like normal life in that sense absolutely absolutely and uh um not all people will like you. Uh, you will not like all people, and that's also perfectly fine. And um, just try to notice that from yourself and from others, and uh, do not stalk them or do not try to force yourself on onto people. That also simply doesn't work. And mm -hmm. sadly, I've not too much, but uh, in uh, sometimes we've seen that too that people are so hopeless well hopelessly is a bit negative but that people are so driven that they uh, they become completely obsessed you know take it easy uh, take take time outside of of doing it technique i spend a lot of time on it technique but it's also important to just do other things spend time with friends spend time with your family uh, uh, do sports do other things um, uh, because that also just helps to clear your brain so you can then after doing that you can just go fully onto doing uh, technical stuff again too yeah and it <laughs> I, I think i'm now sounding a bit like a preacher but believe me these things truly work when when i was digging into problems the the time and that is different for anyone by the way it, it doesn't work the same for all people but the times where i was working on really difficult problems and most of the time where i found a solution and and this is really true was waking up and just in bed pondering about it and thinking wait a minute i've not looked at it from this angle 
that might be another way of looking at it, which might lead to a resolution. And that sometimes that that worked for me. These were the times where I could sometimes uh, solve mm -hmm. an issue which was unsolvable uh, for me before that. Yeah. yeah, very good thoughts. Yeah, and uh, we are more already more than one hour in our golden talks. We still have some questions here, but we are start to go into the end to don't uh, make too long our golden talk session. Okay. Uh, yeah. I have here a question from Alexandre Pires, and he say it's very usual devs uh, put blame on the database. And the DBA needs to expend lots of time investigating to discover that any issue is in the application. Fritz, do you think that a DBA job will end in the next years? Um, if I look at the two uh, different lines, then I think these two lines already answer that the first line answers the question for the second line, in my opinion. And with that, what I'm trying to say mm -hmm. is, I think, and this is a fact of life, I think that any job with the progress of, uh, with the advance of uh, how the technique works, any job mm -hmm. changes. Uh, and uh, for that, my, uh, my father, uh, still lives but my father was a mason and in the 1990s when i said to my father mind you you will be working with a computer he said son i see no reason to ever think that i would be working with a computer and and still at the end when uh, before slightly before he retired he had to put his hours in with a computer so what I'm trying to say here is that um, things will change, even if you think they don't. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, will the DBA do job change? Absolutely. Even if you remain on working with the same technology, it will change. Um, will a DBA job go away? No, I don't think so. Maybe it will get a different name uh, maybe it will be uh, used in a different way for example with the uh, uh, advance of devops which i think by the way is a really really good advance you might not mm -hmm. like it but that's something else but i think the fact that you can define an environment like a software environment is is truly is magnificent because then you can programming it and make sure that things are truly the same uh, whilst in the past when you had to physically create computer environments i would find that people because of the, how the mind of people worked and the people get bored really fast um, that no two computer systems which were hard to set up would actually be the same whilst they had to be the same um, in in reality uh, you, you know, I, I hope I get a message across. It's if you have to do things uh, manually, one thing at a time, uh, then it is the way a human mind works is it's really error prone. And if you can define and if you can do that same work by defining an environment, so use by defining it as software, which is what, in my mind what DevOps do, which is what the ops part of DevOps does. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it can truly be the same because a, com a computer program doesn't get bored. It will just do what you told it to do. It might do it wrong, but then it's your fault. But it will do it the way you defined it. So I think, so, so hopefully I, I, get this, uh, I get this message across. The DBA job will exist, if, even if it's for the fact that that there is a part of developers who don't understand data persistence and therefore run into problems with it, even if it's only for that fact. And that is a fact that a lot of DBAs have encountered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's a very good point. Yeah. And uh, getting this question, I have one with this topic. Uh, in the past, usually the DBAs was like, oh, I'm going to be an Oracle DBA. So you focus all my energy and study on Oracle. Then and SQL Server, MySQL, and so on. Nowadays, we have many database technology, including distributed database. Do you think when you say that the DBA is changing, um, how is going to be the new DBA in this new uh, computer era or new computer technology with cloud? Um, well, what you will see is that a lot of the physical work will move away, uh, and with DevOps, you can define it. If you take a database as, uh, as a service, which uh, I think all the vendors now uh, can provide, then you don't even need to worry about that. Uh, and if you if you have specialized in that area, you well, you probably need to add some areas of database administration to your to your work. To, uh, learn something because, like I said things will evolve and things will change you know um dbase 3 plus the database with which i uh, which i originally learned doesn't exist today mm -hmm. having said that i don't think that the oracle database will move away anytime soon probably the use will lessen because oracle is not that eager anymore to provide it um, um, on premises, it's 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 eager to provide it in the cloud, but not on premises anymore, and and therefore other databases will take that opportunity. Uh, so I think that the market share of Oracle will slowly uh, get lesser, and I cannot say any ratio. I, I generally don't know because that would be looking into the future and if there's one thing that humans cannot do any human for that matter is is look into the future believe me it's 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 true uh, but uh, I would have loved to see that Oracle would put uh, would have put more of uh, effort in, uh, mm -hmm. in in still also providing databases on premises but they don't mm -hmm. Um, and but a, lo a lot of DBAs will encounter that uh, things will move into the cloud, and that therefore all this uh, work on uh, on the infrastructure will slowly move away, and therefore the jobs will move more towards uh, data modeling, uh, capacity planning. I think capacity planning is something which. A lot of people don't do and it's also not easy but that is something which is really needed and is something which also in a cloud is really really important to do because um, knowing how much resources you need to run can save you a big uh, a big amount of money so things will evolve and uh, work will slowly change. Yeah. All right. That's a very good point. So uh, let's go to the quick questions because we are uh, almost at the end of our uh, talk here. So uh, should we start with the quick questions? Uh, Fritz, yep. can you say to us uh, what do you like to drink? Well, uh, it depends on the time of day, but uh, in the morning it's coffee, but in the, uh, in the afternoon and the, uh, in the evening, uh, in the weekends, uh, I, I like a beer. beer. I'm a beer person, cool. not a wine person. All right, cool. Right. And uh, what about the music? What kind of music do you like? I'm a long time heavy metal fan, so uh, and uh, the early yeah, Metallica and yeah and uh, Iron Maiden yep these are the things which I've grown up with and still are very fond of very nice did you ever went in any concert with these bands 
Yes, I've seen uh, Iron Maiden a few times and I've seen Metallica, I think, one time. And I've seen a lot of other bands, uh, a lot of other cool bands like uh, Death, for example, of the late mm -hmm. Chuck Schuldiner. I'm happy to have seen uh, that band. He died before the year 2000, I think. And I've mm -hmm. seen him and uh, Dynamo on Air uh, in uh, Eindhoven. I'm really happy to have seen him. So, yeah. So, music and a uh, very good beer, it's a very nice match, right? Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, cool. And what about sports? What kind of sports do you like to play? Um, I, uh, ever since I was eight years old, I'm, uh, I play table tennis. And actually, tomorrow mm -hmm. I have to go out and uh, play table tennis competition mm -hmm. to, uh, mm -hmm. to towards Amsterdam. Uh, not too early because so. it's too late for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we will have more lockdowns because of uh, of COVID. So I wonder whether mm -hmm. the table tennis competition will finish actually. And it oh. has been uh, closed down uh, before this uh, because of COVID. But mm -hmm. we are in the second half, so, uh, but we'll see. And I like, uh, I like to watch soccer on television and my son is a goalkeeper uh, uh, playing mm -hmm. soccer, so. All right, very nice, cool. And uh, uh, what about the hobbies? What do you like to do in your free time? I, uh, my hobbies are uh, running and running is something, uh, uh, well, actually when I'm doing it, I mostly hate it, but once I've done my run, I feel proud of myself and, uh, and, I, and I feel actually good about it. So I, I keep on doing it uh, and it's, it's easy to do and there is almost no preparation that you need to do, just, you know put uh, uh, running shoes on and, and run. It's, it's that easy. Uh, I like to play bass guitar. I'm a bass guitarist and I play in a band. And uh, this is where I rehearse. Yep. Uh, I, I, I like it very much. And we would have had, uh, re uh, a re uh, we would have been rehearsing this evening if not our singer would have Caught COVID last week, oh my God. so yeah. he's locked down. So we cancelled mm -hmm. the uh, rehearsing uh, today. Sadly, mm -hmm. sadly, yeah. Uh, yeah. So let us know when uh, you uh, be together again and maybe play some song and do some live to see the what what music you're you're gonna play. Okay, <laughs> I. I will see. We uh, we have uh, a good place to rehearse, so we'll see mm -hmm. if we can uh, video and uh, record something uh, and put it on YouTube or something, so mm -hmm. uh, people can see it. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Um, Leonardo is saying, "Can you play for us? Do you, uh, your guitar it's near to you or something like that?" Uh, normally, my guitar would have been uh, really uh, close to me, uh, mm -hmm. behind my back. However, because it's that late in the evening, it's it's now close to 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. uh, I am sitting downstairs, so you now see a, a blind wall. You know, you remember seeing yeah. the books behind me. Yeah. These are now yeah, not yeah, there yeah, because I'm not sitting in my office. I'm mm -hmm. sitting downstairs. So it's right. it's only the dog which is keeping my foot uh, warm now, okay. and that's that's it. Okay, that's fine. It should be better. We see you playing with all the band the next time. Okay, just let us know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, and you said about books. Uh, what kind of books do you like or you would recommend to us? A technical book or? Uh, 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 how can I say this in English? A common book that's not a technical book, also. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, I just forgot the word. It. It's, ne <laughs> it's never too late for rock and roll, and, and that's true. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> although, 
you have to keep your neighbors your friends too but <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, this is a good point you know there is this famous joke where somebody said you know what my neighbor came to me complaining about music and it was good that i was just up rehearsing but <laughs> okay. anyways um for mm -hmm. books um a book that i read actually when i was in high school was uh, which mm -hmm. i really enjoyed reading and which a lot of my peers uh, also mm -hmm. enjoy uh, reading is uh, douglas adams's um, hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy if you like mm -hmm. a bit weird and a bit uh, science fist uh, like science fiction but it also uh, is trying to show you uh, humanity but uh, really emphasized then mm -hmm. reading uh, the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy from douglas adams is a really good mm -hmm. book and actually in the oak table network the mm -hmm. oak table mail list is called uh, list 42 and the number 42 is uh, you might recognize this number as being picked by a lot of people to say something and this number 42 actually comes from the douglas adams hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy book mm -hmm. in which um, they uh, yeah. create a I supercomputer remember. yeah i, I think i'm sorry to i was going to say that the all uh, I, I I will say that uh, about this number, I think on I don't remember if it was on Frank Pacho or Fred Dennis, they mentioned something about this forty two. Yeah, but uh, yeah. sorry, keep, uh, yeah. And but forty two is the answer for uh, from the supercomputer which is built in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy book, which is mm -hmm. built to give humanity the answer to the reason for humanity and the answer is 42 so mm -hmm. that is why you yes. see 42 a lot by it people who like this book because mm -hmm. this is really a funny number and it uh, mm -hmm. reminds uh, of the book uh, technically the book uh, a book which i uh, personally owe a lot to for a learning IT things and especially learning the fundamentals is a book called um, uh, Computers and Architecture, a, um, a quantitative approach. And that is a book by uh, two persons called Hennessy and Patterson. And mm -hmm. I actually looked it up earlier today. And I think you, uh, I found when I typed it in, uh, Computers, Architecture, Hennessy, Patterson. I found PDFs of the book, uh, mm -hmm. so it should be reasonably easy to find. And uh, at the end of the 1990s, I ran into Anjo Kolk, who then was a very famous Oracle uh, performance uh, guy, and he was from the Netherlands. And I ran into him on a, I think it was in the area of Amsterdam, where Oracle was holding a evening on uh, guiding people to install a rack at NetApp so mm -hmm. they would have had central storage and he told me about his book and to read that book and, and use it and that book is a university book which teaches people about the fundamentals of how computers work so of how CPUs work how pipelining and CPUs work at that time it was all about rotating disks because solid state disks at that time didn't exist or at least weren't mainstream so it was all about mm -hmm. how you could calculate uh, response times and throughput numbers from rotating disks etc so mm -hmm. if if you want to go down that route if you think that's interesting uh, it is really tough to go through and it took me a long time to go through but I found it really, really useful. And, you know, one of the useful things which I've never seen up to that time was queuing theory, which was explained in that mm -hmm. book, you know, because mm -hmm. for this guy, oh, queuing theory is really important and, and still is today, you know, as SSDs are a bit faster, but a lot this of is, principles uh, still apply. Yeah, that's what I would say. I would say, uh, I would say that this is when you say the basic principle and I think 
and understood that in this book it had a lot of things like this, right? Yep, exactly. Oh yeah, very nice, very things to share with us. Thanks for that. And uh, the question that I ask to everyone that comes through here, and the question is, what is success to Fritz Hoagland? I'm not even sure if you've asked it before, and it is it is actually hard. I think uh, success is is enjoying your life uh, in uh, and uh, uh, doing uh, and enjoying what you do, and uh, I'm currently doing that. So I think in that sense I'm successful, and yeah, uh, don't. Uh, pay too much attention to what uh, the opinion of others is in that sense uh, and uh, really do what you like and I think you're successful if you have the opportunity to do what you like mm -hmm. cool. all right this is a very good thing uh, very good definition of success and okay so we are here more uh, one hour in more one hour and a half and uh, this Fritz was a very nice take. Thank you very much to accept our invite and come to here to talk with us and share a little bit about your experience and your knowledge here on the Golden Talks. I said once, but I will uh, say once again, thank you to give a piece of your time and share everything that you did today with us here on the Golden Talks today. Okay. Thank you for having me. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, I will end uh, our golden talk today as I do all uh, uh, all the time. Okay. So, if you like this video, don't forget to give your like, subscribe on the channel, and the most important thing is replicate knowledge and share this video. Thank you very much, and see you on the next golden talk session. Bye bye.